we all just got blown up. Nobody died, but like. Well, his intention was to take out as many of you guys as possible. He tried to kill us, he tried yeah. to kill us all, you know. I'm Keen Sherburn, uh, joined the Marine Corps. Uh, 03 uh, was my uh, job and um, 05 to 07. And what rank did you get out? Oh, uh, Lance Corporal. Right on. Um, 03, what did you sign up initially for? I think it's just 03. 03 I don't, I don't, Yeah, I think it was 03 11. Oh, you went out on like a 03 contract? I believe so. Yeah. I, don't, I totally don't remember. <clears throat> no problem. Ended up a machine gunner. 031. Right on. right on. Born and raised up in the high desert, homeschooled. Uh, most of my life, sheltered kid, like, uh, I want to say anti-government family. Um, you know, my dad's Vietnam vet kind of mm -hmm. thing. Um, homeschool most of my life, then went to high school um, and got out um, and went straight to the Marine Corps. I mean, my dad, I say anti-government, but like, you know, vet, Vietnam vet, we raised a lot of history, you know, mm -hmm. like patriotic, very patriotic, very history, learned all about the wars, learned all about, you know, American history, what it, you know, what it was. So. I never wanted, never even thought about military um, until I did, but I was raised with all that background, mm -hmm. you know. Um, you know, my dad's very pro, a lot of guns, things like that, you know. Um, and uh, uh, when I was 10, uh, my parents uh, both had, I ended up going to jail, actually. Really? Um, and I ended up in foster care. Wow. So my dad ended up spending six years in prison. My mom, uh, like two years in jail. I don't know if she went to prison or jail, but then she had to prove like she could take us back. Wow. So um, foster care, all my brothers were, my sisters were old enough, but my brothers, three of us ended up in foster care together, um, which is gnarly. We ended up with like very abusive foster mom. And uh, I was a preacher at the church. He, he was a badass, but his wife was super abusive and like, fed us rice if we didn't like only rice so you could season it. It was weird. But um, that was 10 to like 13 maybe. Um, and we moved around after that. Our house that we grew up in that my dad's dad built um, got knocked down. So we were like in like, you know, um, mobile home trailers, things like that. We ended up in Lucerne Valley, Apple Valley, Bear Valley, all over the high desert um, until I was like 14 or 15. Wow. Yeah. Um, do you know what your parents went to prison for or jail? Yeah, um, my dad went to jail. So, you know, I said they're kind of anti-government. Mm -hmm. um, my parents never really talk about it, but I'm, I'm assuming initially they probably like um, hung out with the wrong people is, is what. But the, what they did, they came in, they did 19 searches on my property, on our property, thinking. So my dad's a prepper, right? So we had a cistern, like his dad's dad built the house. Mm -hmm. It is a cistern. We tunneled in from the house. We had a straight up tunnel that went in from my parents' bedroom down. You slid this like um, this wall open and it was the, our gun room. Like we had a ton of guns, all wow. legal, all legal guns. Uh -huh. And then tunneled down three foot like culvert pipe that went down. The cistern was decked out. So like cistern we had, we could have stayed down there. He had like, we bomb proof like the top. So it was like soil, two feet. Like I think he said a nuclear fallout proof. Wow. Um, and then it went, so the cistern's like in that beside the house. It wasn't a big house. It was like three bedrooms made of like old school, um, like railroad ties and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then there was another tunnel went out the back. And then it, that was like where the porta potty was. And we like, I think we had five or so 55 gallon drums of water back there. And then the vent from there was super smart, went up and then came out where our bathroom was in the house, in the actual house. So that's the vent. So everything was like hidden. Um, and I don't think it was just prepper. My dad's just a prepper. You know, he really? always, yeah. He, he, always, he never like voiced like him being worried about anything specific happening. He, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we had, he said the riots were going to happen. The world was going to fall apart and everybody was going to come up the hill looking for water and food. So we do, we drill, like we had positions on the roof, like where we would go hang out. Like if they come up the hill, like my dad's serious, bro. Wow. Dude. Yeah. Did, and did he run you guys through like any types of drills or anything? Like, like, yeah, we, I mean, like he'd say sound the alarm and you go to your point on the roof, like, like station. Dude, I was made for the Marine Corps. Wow, <laughs> yeah. man. Yeah. And that was, that was before I was 10 years old. Cause by the time I was 10, that happened. So 
add in whatever is a background. My parents are not talking about it, right? And I mean, they say that the, the government wanted our property. That's what my dad says. And it is true, There's, it's in the Golden Triangle. It's in between Ap Vic Victorville, Apple Valley, and Phelan, I think, and it's right in the middle. And now there's a lot of um, like Walmart, Amazon buildings up there. So I know it's on right on 395, the old, uh, so old Route 395. So I don't know what's true there, but then when they came and they found bomb shelter and stuff, and my dad, we, we went to military um, auctions. So that's what our business was. So we we're always at, we go all the old military surplus, we go pick it up in like truckloads. <laughs> and then like, we're talking like camis, shovels, e-tools, all that stuff. Then we fix it up and we sell it at gun show swap meets. So we had military stuff everywhere. Wow, like man. Trucks, ammo boxes. Like if you flew over, you would think, hey, here's some people prepping for like militia, all that. Wow. So 19 searches. To, uh, they kept searching. And so there's that many searches because they, they, did they have an idea that you guys had all that, but they just couldn't find they it? They couldn't find it. They thought we had all these mass, like weapons of mass. I don't know what, the, I have no idea what they're looking at, right? But they had to do 19 searches. They brought out, like the FBI brought out like grounds uh, survey to survey the entire area. Here's what they got my dad on. 16 tracer rounds. Tracer rounds for 556. Five, in all that military surplus that we got, obviously you're going to find ammo in some of that, sh on that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. That's all they. That's all they got him on. So um, can, uh, I guess. Well, I think they said maybe can they. Uh, when his parole came up, they said um, that we we were considered like co-conspirators or something like that. So he couldn't see us. So he ended up spending six years in jail to live out his parole versus coming out and not being able to see us. Mm -hmm. So I think he was only initially supposed to be like sixteen months or something like that for because uh, Tracer is felony in California. Wow. So he came out as a felon. The only felony that's on his record is for, um, there, I think there's small charges like uh, child protective, all that stuff. Mm. Cause we didn't, we weren't, we didn't have running, like or we like lived off the grid. Yeah. Solar, no running water, really? like we had a well. Yeah. Wow. And, and knowing that you know now, looking back on it now, do you think it had anything to do with him being in Vietnam? No, no? he wasn't anything, no. I don't think so. I think he, he worked on um, the weapon guidance uh, for like laser. I don't know. I don't think so. I've never thought about that, to be mm. honest with you. So you go to foster care mm. and then your parents get you guys back? Yeah. So my mom gets me back. My dad's still in jail. So mm. then we went, he was out in um, Ironwood, which is out like Blythe, Arizona border. And so we go visit him all the time, mm. you know, maybe once a month, something like that. So that's where we grew up with my, my mom on that, and then my dad got out, and we all got back together. But then the property was gone, you know? So then we we're like living out of a van and stuff, and um, at some point, my parents, I think it was 14 or 15, my parents decided to move back to Arizona, or to move to Arizona, They're like California's done for us. And um, I was in high school, and I'm like, um, at that time I already decided to join the Marine Corps, this is post 9-11. Mm. So I said, hey, here's my agreement, is that I will, I'm not going to Arizona. You know, I'm playing sports out here. Um, I don't want to do that. You know, and I'm going to the Marine Corps. They wouldn't sign for me. I don't know what their reason is, you know, anti-government kind of thing. And um, so I said, here's my agreement. So I'll, I will graduate high school and right after I'm going to the Marine Corps. But I'm not moving to Arizona. So I moved out on my own at 15. Um, I stayed in a friend's house. They had bought a new house, like built it. And I stayed there and I like put in new lawn for them. I put in gravel. Do we, we're a working family. Like we wanted something, my parents never bought it for us. You went out, pull weeds until you could get it. My first dirt bike, I pulled weeds for probably two years. So you, you know were doing, mean? so you were doing yard work to make money. At like 15 years old, dude, I put in their entire gravel yard. I painted the house. I did crazy stuff for the house, but I got to live there by myself. Wow. You know, I get my girlfriend to come by, by yourself. Myself. Yeah. By myself. At 15. In a full like giant house in Apple Valley. Dude, that's crazy. Yeah. Did you ever throw any parties? Nope. I was a good kid, dude. Really? Uh, yeah. I, I, had, I didn't drink my first alcohol until like a couple months before I went to boot camp. Wow. I was a good kid. Wow. Yeah. Um, so what inspired you to uh, sign up for the military? 9-11. Mm. 100%. Yeah. I was, my dad was still in jail. Um, we were living in Lucerne Valley in, uh, in a mobile home. <clears throat> and... Uh, yeah, it's crazy to think about, bro. Um, my mom and my sister, um, 
Let's see, I think, I don't know where everybody else was, but my mom and my sister are, um, I get up one morning, like six in the morning, I used to listen to this radio show called uh, Kevin and Bean Show. Mm. It's like these funny guys. And I was, that was the first thing I did when I woke up, I was listening to you guys because it was like comedy, you know? And they started talking about a plane that hit a, hit a tower and I was like, oh, what is this? Like, what if? Like, remember to hear what if? And then I walked out to the living room and my parents don't watch, my mom doesn't watch TV. Like, we didn't grow up with TV at all. And my mom and my sister, Neri, are sitting in front of the couch watching something like pale white. Walk out and uh, no life. And we sat there, dude. We, we watched the second plane hit. Mm. And it's crazy. My mom and my sister are the single biggest thing that, that did it for me. Like I saw somebody come and take their piece away. And I was like, I'm going to fucking do something. Mm. Plain and simple, dude. It's, it's like I can remember that exact moment where it's like I'm doing something about this. Yeah. You know? Um, and when it came to like who to join, it's the Marine Corps. Like I'm a set, I was a history. Like I loved history growing up. I was like badass. My dad always used to say, I was drafted in the Army, but I got to join, I joined the Marine Corps. Mm. I always remember that. So nice. That was it. Um, what was your recruiter experience like? Uh, I probably was the easiest guy to recruit, dude. Because, um, I knew I wanted to go infantry. I was like, I want to fight. I went in, I scored pretty high. I don't remember what it was. A high 70s or 80s, something like that. Wow. Um, and uh, homeschool, dude, my mom's got her master's in teaching. Like, she's, she made us smart, you know? Yeah. And my dad's like, you know, engineer. So um, I, I scored pretty high on it. And, um, but I was like, I'm going infantry, you know? And at that time, like, since 2005, easy decision for them I'm like are you sure ha absolutely yeah i'm going infantry were they tripping out on you like you scored so high yeah you got yeah, all yeah. these jobs available i think so i that to be honest with you man i was at uh, maps in or uh, the the recruiters in little puente i don't remember much about that hmm. you know that's kind of that, that yeah but um talk to me about boot camp and what was yeah. it like for you um i mean it was pretty uh i remember my dad said the most important thing to me he said do not be first don't be last, find you well somewhere in the middle of the pack. Being from a fit family, like PT was not hard. Like, you know I mean? I mean, it's challenging, don't get me wrong. Of course it was super hard. The mental game was harder, harder than that. But I don't remember it being that challenging, to be honest. Like, I think that when your eyes like on a prize so much, like you're going, you're going, you know? You're excited. You're just excited, dude. I'm, I'm like, I was amped, right? Yeah. I was like, I still, I was so filled with rage back then, you know, yeah. 18 year old kid, just like, get me to war, yeah, wow. which is crazy to think about now, cause, you know, yoga instructor now and all that, but at that time, just rage, like, yeah, wow. you know, um, I do, I, I do, I have, I have, uh, well, I probably one funny story. Uh, I had my wisdom teeth taken out. Wow, in boot, in camp? boot camp? Yeah, all four of them, because they don't, they don't play around. Because their goal is, right, like, let's get everything done right here, right now, all your shots, everything. So when you're ready, you're leaving. You're going. So they go in, they take my wisdom teeth out, all four of them. They send me back to Squad Bay um, with, a, like, don't talk, right? With a chit, supposed to hand this to the drill instructor and say, hey, um, I can't talk. My feet, my mouth is sewn up on top and bottom, right? Hand it to the drill instructor. Drill instructor is like, sorry, what? Sound off. Right? I'm like, sound off. So I sound off. I bust it open. They send me back to medical. They're like, what happened? Drill instructor made me sound off. Sew it back up. Go back again. You know drill instructors are. They'll mess with you. I forget if it happened two or three times. It might have only been twice. It was the second or third time. The doctor comes back with me. Sew it up again. Doctor comes back, walks in the squad bay, closes the door, because he's an officer, closes the door with the drill instructor. And that's the last I heard of it. I just laid in my rack. Ooh. Yeah, I think he like went in there, yelled at the drill instructor and was like, hey dude. Yeah, you know wow. What, I mean? what unit did you get dropped to from there? Three, five. I got there and everybody just came home from Phantom Fury. Um, the mm -hmm. initial push through Fallujah, mm -hmm. okay. which was I think in 04. Okay. Yeah, 04. So I got back, they had just got back from that deployment. Lost 19 guys. Um, and it was messy, like bad. I mean, any of the stories of Fallujah you hear of the initial one are like kill houses, um, you know, dragging their buddies out of like multiple buddies out of houses and stuff. Mm -hmm. So the stories we heard and like were these young Marines 
And these guys were like, they made us pay. I get dropped. Most of the guys are drunk. I forget one of the guys name ran us immediately. Drop your gear, ran us straight to the, um, the gas chamber up at Mateo. So we ran there. So I don't know, it's like two kilometers outside of it, straight there and started just messing with us. That's how we got. And it was like bapti baptism by fire. Wow. Those guys were messed up, dude. Like mm. mentally. I still remember this day. It was like, like, dude, what did we just walk into? Yeah. Still the excitement, but like, they treat us like crap, dude. Like, you know, yeah. hazy was on the level I've never even experienced. We started training um, and we were getting ready to go back. I will say when it got to training, like our seniors were some of the best in the world. Mm. Like my, my senior, um, Herbie, we called him, uh, Corporal McCombs, one of the most badass machine guns I've ever met in my life. Everything I learned in SOI was like, you know, nothing. Like he just taught me to be one of the best 50 gunners I've ever met in my life. You know, mm. just like, dude, was, he was my height and 31s and everybody can confirm this. You're either five foot five like me or you're six foot, you know, you're, you're like cornbread. Mm. So you got the little, there's no in between. Giant guy or little guy? And he was a little guy like me. Um, he ended up being my, um, my vehicle commander in Iraq too. Mm. So just a badass dude. I mean, seriously, and what's crazy now is he looks even younger than now in 2023. He looks younger than he did back then. Really? He's, I, I have no contact with him. I've seen him on Facebook. But um, some of the most badass like Marines I've ever met in my life. I imagine they had a lot to offer just coming back from being in the suck. Yeah. Right? Once they took us in, once they embraced us, and they always, me even in deployment, dude, we were getting like, if I was driving the truck, I remember getting like booted in the back of the head for like bump going off road. And like those Humvees were up armored Humvees with no suspension. And so like they fucked with us all the time, mm -hmm. all the time. But like you knew where it was coming from. And like they would take the time and say, hey man, this is how you do it. I might get booted in the back of the head, but when we got back to base, it'd be like, hey, you know, try to do this better. Or um, I will say this, some of the best Marines I've ever met. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. Talk to me about um, going overseas. Uh, you're prepping to go to Fallujah, is that yeah. right? Iraq. Yeah. Um, did you guys, were you part of a MU or did you fly over? No, we flew up, flew over. Okay. I think we went to March, um, hopped on some. Um, U.S. I think the U.S. Airways plane mm -hmm. flew into Kuwait. Um, flew into Kuwait, spent maybe a day, um, and then flew from Kuwait and C-130s um, into some opera, some base in Iraq. Do not remember where it was. Somewhere outside of Fallujah, middle of the night, they fly us in, um, and everybody's reaction like, "You've been on C-130." They're like, "You know this rifle between your legs." Um, I remember I had, I bought right before I left, I bought the original iPod, which was had like the little window as a little brick, you know, yeah. I had 60 gigs. I was like, yes. So I had my, I had my earphones in shaking plane and they said, we're not going to land at the base. We're going to land somewhere outside the base. The plane's never going to stop and we're going to run in. So we're like, we're thinking, cause they're like, if they said, if we land by the base, they'll mortar it, something like that. Mm. So we landed legit plane never stops. I remember guys were nervous. Some guys were throwing up. I don't really remember. I just remember I had my ear pods in. Um, and then it's the plane stops, gate went down, never like slow down. Obviously we all ran out the back, took off right away. Mm. We're in Iraq. Wow. Yeah. So then we went into this, I remember going to this base and like Hesco bears, it was buried. Like, like I remember going down into this Hesco bears, went and stayed in these big tents. I think we stayed one night. They put us on seven tons, flew us through Fallujah. And they're like, this is where we're going to get hit. If we're going to get hit, like it's going to be in Fallujah or like driving through it. So we went in seven tons. They took us through the city and then dropped us out our fobs um, right outside, right off the Euphrates. I think we stopped at um, uh, Fob Black, I think it was. I think it was called. Okay. Um, yeah, um, if anybody knows the Fallujah thing, um, uh, they called it, oh, there was the, the bridge was called um, Blackwater Bridge because they had just, when we got there, they had just hung up uh, six um, Blackwater, guys. Blackwater contractors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, dude, they caught them, they dragged them through the city, and then they hung them up on this bridge. 
Yeah. It's freaking gnarly. So when we got there, that just happened. Wow. So they're like, hey, we're not using this bridge anymore or something. We use the next bridge down. Like for us, that bridge was like no go. Mm. I don't know if we ever use it again, something like that. But yeah, dude, getting into Fallujah was nuts. Like wow. you just like you're young. We've just been told for six months the stories of Fallujah from our seniors. So we, we flew, they, uh, weapons company, weapons company with 3-5 anyways, we're like kind of the bitch of the battalion, right? You, whoever needs you, you are in support. So we operated on our own in CAT, uh, not CAT, we right before we left went to map, map units. So I think we had three map units, one, two, and three from weapons company. Um, my map went to Zidon area, which was outside of Fallujah. Um, I don't remember where, but it was somewhere kind of far from that. So we left from black and we went out there and we uh, left seat, right seat, left seated with, uh, right seat, sorry, right seated with, I think it was two seven. So they were, we were taking over for them, mm. right? So they were there. So they're showing, hey, this is your AO. Um, this, you know, this, this is where we take fire. This is here, hot spot here, you know? And then we spent, I think two to three weeks there by ourselves in the Zidon. Um, and that's like, um, it was probably right after that, while we were with them, nothing happened. No IEDs, nothing. As soon as we take over, I think they like, I mean, they're smart people. Anybody who tells you who we were fighting over there was dumb, hasn't been there. They're incredibly planned, incredibly intelligent in some of these places, like the bomb lane, all that stuff, the idea lane. Um, so we're in the Zidon, and uh, I remember they just left. We set up in this field, um, uh, like two roads, and there was like a um, real tall, um, like, I don't know what you call them, like, there's a lot of um, agriculture over there. Mm -hmm. So whatever they're growing over here, we set up in this, on, like in the L of a, of a road, we set up all of our vehicles in a 360, okay? There was a house behind us, road, road, where we could watch. And we were told like they plant IEDs here. So we just sat there. So we 360 the trucks. We put uh, camo netting over the whole truck. I remember talking to our, our lieutenant and being like, I'm, I'm, I'm the gunner, right? I'm a 50 gunner saying, hey, I don't think we should camo net the whole truck. If we do that, I can't turn my turret around. I can only see this. <laughs> so my gun is facing where that corner on the road is, right? He's the officer, obviously. I'm stupid Lance Corporal. We tent, the, we like camo net the whole thing. I'm on post all night. And those turrets, as everybody knows, you can't like, it's hard to climb inside of it. Normally you climb up and over to get out. So I've been on post all night. Um, sun's starting to come up and I'm the first thing to move in our, in our convoy, right? I'm getting relieved. So I climb out of the turret, climb over the shield on my 50 and step onto the, onto the hood. I reach up for my M4. As soon as we did, they hit us. Two different positions, no idea where it came from. They just literally sprayed our vehicles. And I, like, I'm talking, just everything's getting hit. And I remember le reaching up, I'm like, I'm not getting off the hood without my M4. So I'm reaching up, trying to grab it. And I look down, like, you know, your windshield's right here. And our lieutenant's sitting in the, in the driver's seat, or in the, in the VC seat, like, like waving, get off the hood, you know? And I'm like, I'm not getting without my rifle. I don't know how long it took me, but it felt like an infinity, like trying to get, finally was like, it's, you have like two brackets inside of it. So it was like kind of stuck there and I'm trying to reach up over. So he's like, get off the hood. So I dive off the hood, dude. The, the videos of bullets is like, is nothing. The crack, explosion, like I, I've never been so scared in my fucking life. You know what I mean? <laughs> like yeah. literally I'm gonna die. And it's just pinging off everything. And um, I remember, so I'm beside the vehicle and I'm trying to roll underneath the Humvee as the ground and everything's exploding around me. Um, and then it just stops, stops. I thought I was gonna die, I'm alive, stops. Completely quiet, goes back to nothing. Door opens, I'm like, like this, and the door, driver door's right here. Door opens, Comeric, our driver, drops me as an M4, and then everybody just goes into freaking like, Rifles up, running, shooting at everything, nothing. Nobody saw anything. They crawled up and we ended up finding piles of brass. They crawled up with RPKs from two different positions. One in where those tall bushes, bushes were, crawled up there. One was out in the field. And then when we, by the time we, like we found the brass later, nothing. Nobody got hit. Like, wow. freaking gnarly. 
That was your first. Was that, that was your first? That was the first one. <laughs> first, first bullets I heard. Welcome it to Iraq. That, one, that was that was Zidon. Wow. Yeah. Um, only other thing that happened in Zidon was like we, and I think that same firefight we had killed a cow, like we or somebody bullets, you know. Right. So two days later, they dragged the cow to the side of the road, um, and like boarded it out. So when we drove, we drove by it and realized that either there's an IED in it or they're gun oops. They would bore out the animal, put a one five five shell inside. So you drive by thinking it's a dead animal. So I blew it in half with a uh, first sergeant came out and they're like, hey, it might be an ID. We could get EOD out here. They're like first sergeant's like, hey, let's let's just blow it up. So I hit it with a Mark 19. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> there was dogs. There was dog. I, I don't know if I should say this, but there was dogs eating it as and I was hoping like the burst was good because they were not dogs over there, dude. They were like ravenous animal. Yeah. <laughs> so I remember like first burst did it and then the second burst, I like cows. <laughs> that was pretty cool. Wow. And then Zidon, Zidon was done and we went back to Fallujah. Hmm. Um, and then our primarily, we did two, two uh, MSR, two, two uh, main supply routes from TQ into Fallujah. They were called um, Iron and Boston. And then we just patrolled those 10 times a day. Most of our job was um, IED prevention. We did a lot of missions into Fallujah, like we'd go infiltrate a, a sniper team. Middle, middle of the day, sometimes you go drive in, pull up to a house, do like a uh, um, knock on the door, kick down the door, something like that. Everybody gets out, makes a big scene. Everybody gets back in the truck and leaves, but you just put in a sniper team. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you just make a big scene, 10, 20 guys get out of the truck, gunners stay in, and then you just leave, but the sniper team's been infiltrated. So, you know, we did stuff like that. Um, we did snatching, uh, snatching grabs middle of the night, um, um, stuff like that. But I'd say most of it was IED, just IED sweeps, these two mm -hmm. roads. We did pickets middle of the night. We go out there and we just better, uh, spread our trucks 500 meters apart. And your job is just to like, do you, and while main supply run, uh, convoys would go through. So your job was just to be out there and be a, um, deterrent, mm -hmm. you know? to not let them plant IEDs, but there's so much road. You'd be out there 500 meters apart in your trucks or longer, just you, scary yeah. as shit, dude. You know, wow. it's pitch dark, nothing to see. MVGs sucked back then. <laughs> um, do, you, uh, do you recall any specific stories that stand out from that deployment? Yeah, dude. Um, I, I think this is long enough back, well, anybody who was gonna get in trouble would get in trouble now. We uh, intentionally drove over an IED this is a pretty good story. Intentionally, uh, intentionally drove over an intentionally IED? Drove, yep. Oh, shit. So we were patrolling, I think it was Boston, heading back, MSR Boston, Main Supply Road Boston. We'd been on pickets all night, okay? So we would, what's crazy is you'd go down these roads 10 times a day, and they would literally run out behind you and plant an ID. Like, we would go 10 times, you would find 10 IEDs. Like, they're brazen. Some of them are really well hidden, some of them are really shitty hidden, right? So we're heading back, it's like one in the morning, I'm driving. So lead Vic, I see on the side of the road, I see what looks like a, best way to describe it, like a real estate sign, okay? Up off the ground, box with Arabic writing on it. I'm like, that wasn't there before, just out of place. So we pull up, we like get close enough to it and we pull like deeper into the road and get kind of like beside where you can look at it. And it looks wrong and it is, it's a big box that's up on stands, like, I don't know, box on stands with writing. It's supposed to look like a sign, but when you saw it sideways, it's a box. So we had, um, I forget what we called them. We had a little robot we sent out there, drive them up there. There's no wires. There's nothing to this thing. They're not. It's something super wrong that it just put this box, but there's a hinge on the top of it. We can see with the robot. That's all we see. Okay. So we're like, okay, well, if it's not an ID, it's going to, do they think that we're going to go up and open this box? Are we going to be curious to open the box? So we're discussing and we're on the hook with, uh, with Lieutenant and we're like, at, um, and we're like, what do we, what do we do with this? Right. It's like, well, can you shoot at, okay. We shoot out with the M6, uh, M4, nothing. Um, shoot out with a grenade launcher. So I remember uh, Corporal Fizzle uh, shoots out with a grenade launcher and Lieutenant said like you take like six shots, that's it. It was some, something weird. Like the discussion happening was not Marine Corps. It was just like, like 
high schoolers trying to figure out what to do with this box, dude. So we're like, somebody's like, can you drive by and wrangle it? Like, 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 like lasso it kind of thing. Like everybody, like, how do we, we're trying to figure out what to do with this box. Finally, we decide, what if we just drive up with the Humvee and slowly push it over? So that's what we're going to do. <laughs> Lieutenant clears it. We're going to drive up, push the box over. So then everybody's like, well, who's going to do it? I want to do it. I'm least on the totem pole and some of the seniors wanted to, the senior Lance Corporals wanted to. I think it was, um, I think it was Comerica who got to do it. And we're like, so we all sit back, we're watching through MVGs and he drives up to it, pushes on it in the box tips and then he backs off. Okay. There's nothing in the box, right? Drives up again, tips it, boom, shit goes off. And through MVGs, we're back maybe 200 meters. It would, it, it would seem humongous. So we're walking like, dude, we killed Chimeric, right? So Humvee's like smoking. It's not in flames, it's just smoking. It was not that big enough to like, that could have, but we don't know. Some last smoke coming out, door opens, Chimeric comes out, Kevlar in hand, just like kind of staggering. And that was, he was fine, just concussed. Holy and shit. And it was anti-personnel, because when they looked at the front of the Humvee, ball bearings, nails, I think they thought that somebody was going to come around on a ground patrol and open the box. I, uh, I can't, we can't think what else we did. Like, what was the purpose of this box? Yeah. With a lit, with like a hinge, there was no wires. It was clearly had something inside, like, you know, to open it up and it would go off and it was meant to be anti-personnel. Destroyed the front of the Humvee. So, um, well, I, the, I, we didn't get in trouble, but lieutenant i think staffs aren't probably got in big trouble like dude you, imagine if he would have if it would have took his life that's where somebody would have had to pay for that i remember that i remember the moment of being like we like we killed him you know what i mean you, you guys didn't have eod attached we did dude we call we call eod okay first off it's like one or two in the morning <clears throat> it takes eight hours take him eight hours to get there we would sit on that road exposed like cordon off this area and then sit there in 140 degree weather waiting for them in the day. So we, if like the, I, they wanted to like us to call them cause they wanted to find out who the bomb maker was, all this stuff. Right. Um, but like, unless you had to for things like that, no, you didn't. And they probably wouldn't even show up in the middle of the night. Mm. I like, so Hurt Locker, when I saw Hurt Locker and they're like, security goes down and they're like, Pop grab the, the SF team goes down, right? And he grabs a sniper rifle. And I'm like, no, that was us setting up your security way. You, you could have gone in there in board shorts. No, your job's up. It's a hard job. I would never want to just, but I, we, didn't, we didn't really love EOD when we were out there. Like, yeah. <laughs> they were lazy. And then we get back to TQ and they're sitting on top of their Connex box like sunbathing. Oh, shit. You know? So we had a love hate with them because we just, like, I remember how many times we sat out there waiting for them to show up like forever. Uh, so when, if, if we didn't get passed up to like battalion level, we would, we would, uh, we blast it. When we were out there, we would, we'd have like the main fobs for the operating bases, but cat or map, we normally took over houses. So basically we found places that we thought would be a good deterrent spot. So we had OP rock, which is just this big dirt over, over rock that we dug in. They ended up putting a fob there after us, but we just, literally dug a hole, put up things. We got mortared there constantly, sniper file, because it was, it was just a deterrent spot. We had a good operating view of MSR, the, the main supply route. So we had one, and then one down on the other end, we had one, um, two houses. We called them OP Mansion. I think who was out there, um, Recon had one, I think it was First Recon, had one of the houses. They're literally two identical houses, okay, side by side. And uh, we had the second house, so we put um, sandbagged, you know, sandbagged the house up. It wasn't a fob. It was like a fob that we did basically, mm -hmm. right? Double, double sandbags, put posts on the roof. And we saw, oversaw this, this side, um, this part of the road. And then we run patrols from there, right? So that was our forward operating base. We stay out there for weeks, you know? Um, and so this one went here. And then if you kept going, you get into Fallujah. So uh, one, I think it was a Friday, it was a Friday, um, the mosques start going off, right? They start their prayers. Well, you hear the prayers enough, you know when something else is differently. So sometimes we'd have our, uh, our chirps, our interpreters like, hey, 
Does this sound different? You know, um, we believe that they were like giving out messages like, hey, stay inside or hey, we're going to do something because it just sounds different. Right. So if you had an interpreter, you had him, hey, something different or you just like kind of know something's going to happen. So we're heading uh, back towards Fallujah from um, from uh, OP Mansion. I'm driving lead Vic. Um, I think we have three vehicles with us. Never left the wire with less than three vehicles. Um, behind me is Doc in a high back, which is uh, just you know two two people sitting, and it's got a high back that you carry more guys in the back. I'm in lead 50 driving the truck. So we come up to what's uh, we're coming up to a mosque. There's a mosque on the right and a pink schoolyard. We call, just call it the schoolhouse on the on the left side, and there's a big blind turn before you get to there. Okay, so we we're coming up to that turn. We already feel like something's wrong. There's the mosque and there's a schoolyard. There's normally a ton of people out there. Nobody. Okay. Friday, normally a ton of people out. Um, we come up to that blind turn in the road. Old guy crosses the street in front of the vehicle, like creepily crosses. We're big gun trucks at that time. When we drove, all cars got off the side of the road. If they stayed on the road, we shot them. Plain and simple. Like we had road superiority on all those big. There was one big one called MSR Michigan. I think it was the only road that I knew the cars didn't have to get off the side of. We had supreme, like, and they all knew that. So nobody crossed in front of gun trucks, right? We're like, you know, three vehicles, 15 guys, big guns. Everybody stayed back. The kids run up, but they never ran. This old guy walks in front of us, um, in front of the vehicle, super close, doesn't look anything. We're like, super weird. This is in the blind turn in the road. Um, we get up to the opposite side where I sighted him, but we haven't seen two guys walk across. Okay. My job is to, as a driver, to observe everything I see, drive and let my vehicle commander make all decisions. Right. In the vehicle, we start talking, something's up. We should snap those guys, snap those guys. as We like go up, grab them, detain them and be like, Hey, what's up? I'm letting him make that decision. We're still our, our ID sweeps are like 13 miles an hour. Like super slow, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm letting that work. Those guys are still within eye shot, but I've like I've moved on to my next priority, right? What I'm what I'm doing. Let uh, uh, Sergeant Hare make that decision. Coming up to the pink school, blue minivan, family inside of it, left side of the road, okay, right behind it with family in it. And so I, you go through check checklist like safe, safe, and you move on. Like looking anything out of the ordinary, you can't. You can't like stay on one thing. You have to keep checking them off and move on. Blue minivan, family, no, no threat. Move on right behind it. And they're facing this way, right? I'm driving this way. They're facing on the side of the road. Um, red car, one guy in it. Suspicious, right? I, this is my mind thinking about it. Look at this one guy. As we drive by, he's facing this way. Look at him, make eye contact with him. He smiles at me, okay? I check him off my list. Everything I, this guy, if he's a suicide bomber, he's going to kill himself. We're told like new clothes. Like we have all these like, you know, things that we learned going into theater, like what to look out for. A guy smiling at you is not somebody who's about to kill himself. In my book, I checked him off, right? As soon as we drove by, boom, out. Oof. So um, when we came to, like, I remember when we got out of the vehicle, thinking like, where's the hole? Like thinking it was an IED. Cause the last thing I remembered was checking off the vehicles, right? Like there was, that was not a threat. Um, and this is right in front of the pink school. So I remember coming to, I remember seeing the family running away from the, from the van. Um, and the van was like pelted, like destroyed, pretty destroyed. No hole. The road's just a mess. Body parts, like, like fuel, everything, right? Um, no red car. Like it was, it was a V bed on the opposite. So this was this side on the opposite way down here is what's left of this car, which is nothing like, um, he detonated it too early. Didn't kill anybody. Wow. Um, like what about you guys? Concussed, not unconscious. Yeah. Mm. Not, not uh, unconscious is a purple heart. So wow. you have to be unconscious like conscious i guess yeah everybody was good though yeah it was good yeah everybody fucking just 
the Humvee did it. They were like, <clears throat> I think they were like 11,000 pounds. We had the up-armored Humvees, which we had been told the deployment before, they were like welding their own plates on their Humvees, which is crazy, right? They had like a, no, wind, no bulletproof windows. They were like rode back like this because there's a cutout. Like, so we had at least up-armored Humvees, but they basically took the regular Humvee, welded a shitload of armor on top of it. Um, so same chassis, same brakes, everything. We blew stuff all the time, but at least the armor was pretty solid, you know? Wow. Um, but as we got smarter with the vehicles, they adapted, shaped charges, you know, kept going with this. So when we came to, right, you see the mess of the road, we realized what it is. All we found left of the, of the guy in the car was, um, was his leg, which had been shortened, condensed, and like his head wasn't, it was like a mask, it was part of his face. And Doc, our Doc Bromley was in the high back. Well, the engine block from the car landed on his high back in the hood. Like, so his high back is covered in brains and everything else. Like it was pretty gross, right? Mm. Doc's like this uh, big old cornbread guy that we had to stop from kicking down doors. He should not have been a corpsman. He should have been like, he wanted to be, but like Doc, you know, like you're our Doc, <laughs> you know? And um, so I remember at some point, Doc had the leg, guy's leg in the face, and he's out in the middle of the road, like smashing the guy in his own face. Like, you fucking, like, gnarly. He was pissed. He was pissed. But like, it's hard for anybody to understand, but like, we all just got blown up. Nobody died, but like, well, his intention was to take out as many as you guys as possible. He tried to kill us. He tried yeah. to kill us all, you know. Yeah. So, like, that's war. But, um, yeah. Like, I still have a picture of the guys, like, holding the guy's face. Wow. Which is gnarly. Um, so, that's stuff, like, it's, um, I don't know. I look back at now, it's pretty gruesome, right? But at the time, you're just so angry, to, you know. And you're, we're laughing about it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Which is gnarly, but. I mean, that's war, man. It's, and it's fucking war, right? This guy just tried to kill you. <laughs> Your emotions are, you know. Um, um, yeah. Uh, talk to me about the, the second time. Yeah. So, um, second one. So, I'm a machine gunner. I spent the majority of my deployment in the machine gun. The 50 cal was the majority of it, but you have to be trained to do everything on that truck, right? Some, you know, gunner goes down, you need to be able to gun, you need to be able to drive. So they actually sent me to Humvee school in, in, uh, in Iraq. So, so they were doing a Humvee school in Iraq. Yeah, dude. That T, I think it was TQ. Wow. Yeah, dude. It was like a, I don't know, it was a one week thing or something like that. Or no, probably not even that. A couple of days. They took us out, gave us these um, turbo, turbocharged, supercharged Humvees and like how to, you know, <laughs> void IEDs yeah. and stuff. And yeah, that's actual straight up school. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. So um, I get certified to go drive a Humvee as well. Uh, that's a Marine Corps, right? Certified to do everything. <laughs> um, and uh, so. First one, I was driving it. Majority of the time, like I said, I spent in the 50 cal. Um, and, uh, and some in the Mark 19, which is our rear, our rear gun. But 50 cal, um, May, probably two weeks later, um, which was April 22nd, 2006. Um, we're on the same road, going, uh, no, opposite direction, probably two or three kilometers from the, the first blast, and I think two weeks apart. We're coming from Fob Black, which is right outside of Fallujah, coming towards OP Mansion. It's a Saturday. It's our day off. We're told patrol Iron or Boston, patrol Iron, head back, and you get the day off in TQ. So everybody in super good spirits. Um, also noted, at a concussion, like if loss of consciousness, you're supposed to be out for 30 days. That did not happen. You know, there's no blood. This is Marine Corps. There's no blood coming out. You're talking, you're fine. So all of us who were concussed should have been not on patrol, but we were. Um, I don't think that led to anything because I, I don't remember, I don't remember any residuals at all, you know, maybe, but um, we were still operational, obviously. Mm -hmm. So I was in the lead Vic. Um, all the roads over there, the main supply routes were big, heavy duty roads, big, thick. Saddam wanted, he built these roads because he wanted to be able to move his tanks from city to city, right? Hadith, uh, Fallujah, Baghdad. So these are big, heavy roads raised up and then um, agriculture on both sides, the fields where they plant stuff. Well, there's drainage pipes going underneath the road, okay? 
we started finding, literally, I tell you 10 IEDs in a matter of hours and 10, 10 runs. So they, we, get, we keep finding them, right? And we get really good at finding these IEDs. So they got smarter and smarter and smarter. So we're patrolling, I'm in the lead vehicle. Herbie says something funny. We laugh. Um, I remember getting picked up. Like, just remember getting blasted, like feeling like weight, like I was flying uh, and nothing. Um, I come to on the road, not in the Humvee, um, look down, flak jacket's been blown off of me and I'm just red, solid red. Um, and I'm nowhere near my Humvee and the road is just like, um, debris, you know, 50 ammo, rocks, just nothing. Um, remember looking down, finding my M4, M4 somewhere on the ground next to me, no pistol grip on it or no grip on it and holding it. It's the last thing I remember. Um, what happened is they had buried, went underneath the road, filled it full of explosives, a three foot culvert pipe, packed the entire thing full of explosives, welded steel plates on the side of it to make a shape charge to go up. Oof. We drove over it. They found a wire running off into, into like a house, maybe half a mile away. What's crazy is we shoot the tow, the tow missiles we use over there. They have the, the uh, a wire that comes out the back. I think that's what they use. They repurpose our wire. Cause once you shoot a tow missile, the wire stays there. I'm pretty sure that's what they use. I remember them saying, um, I hear this, uh, when, you know, when I was back in the States. Um, so they, yeah, they ran a command debt wire and we drove over it. We were first vehicle, picked up the Humvee from the back end and flipped it end over end, Tonka toyed it. 11,000, it might have even been more. I forget how much those Humvees weighed. When it got this way, it sent me eject button and blasted me from the turret. Ooh. Ended up saving my life because it landed on its roof, skidded on its roof. I mean, I don't know how many times it had rolled, but flipped it back on its wheels. Um, blew the doors off, all the doors got blown off the Humvee, peeled the roof back. Um, and, uh, but if I, if I had stayed in the Humvee, it would have taken my, taken my head off. Would have crushed you, huh? You ready to kill me, dude. Ooh. So, um, they said when I got, when they, um, when they got to me, because you can't, this is what's crazy about those IEDs is you can't rush, you could have a burning Humvee, like which we, we dealt with, and you can't rush in there and save your guys because they, the, the daisy chain, they'll have a secondary IED. And so before you can run in there, um, we have to, they, my guys have to set up a cordon. So we do what's called fives and 25s. They get out, patrol five, five meters outside their vehicle, then push that out to 25, set up a cordon around the area. Then they can come in and get whoever's injured, you know? In this case, it was you. In this case, it was me. So I don't know how long, what that time was, but when they got to me, they said, I was on the road, conscious, holding, which what I remember, a blown up AR or M16, holding the barrel, saying, where do I shoot? Just red, no gear, nothing left on me. Everything been blasted off. Um, solid red, just like I was beat up. Wow, man. Um, and where were you they, bleeding from? What, like, did you, did, were you just covered in shrapnel? Shrapnel, um, my whole face had been caved in. So left side of my face, it got pushed in. Um, they had to reconstruct my whole uh, zygomatic arch and orbital bone. This whole left side of my face and my Kevlar was caved in. I had my ballistic glasses, which they had been pushed into my eye, saved my eye. Um, and they had to like pull that out. Um, so wow. the whole literally bone, everything just got caved in. So I couldn't see anything out of that. And then I had lacerations, blasts, like everywhere. Um, uh, uh, shattered my pelvis. Um, uh, shattered my right, yeah, my right scapula got split in half, blew my rotator cuff, labor them out, um, shot on my left knee, um, uh, a bunch of other stuff, obviously another concussion and just like lacerations everywhere. Dude, so. I'll say this, whoever your doctor is did a fantastic job, man. I'm I, blessed, man. I, I could have never have guessed that your face was caved in like yeah. that from looking at you right now, dude. You look fucking great. Uh, that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> that's wild. I feel blessed, man. I really oh, do. Man, I can't, I can't imagine. Yeah. Um, so I imagine this is where you start to get processed out. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, they sent me to Germany. Um, like that's that's I mean that's I think that that's that's the um, the part about that, I mean that's why I'm at where I'm at. They sent the best doctors. I was in Landstuhl, Germany, where they did multiple facial op operations. And they said it was like piecing a, a eggshell that had been shattered. Like they take out a piece, wash it, put it back together with plates and screws and stuff. But they have like 30 year surgeons there. You know, like the best of the best because everybody from Afghanistan, everybody from Iraq, got like uh, all those injured guys all got sent to uh, Ramstein or Landstuhl, Germany. And um, those guys, I mean, I've never met any of them. If I were to meet one of those doctors, like, you know, I'd, you know, save my life, save like so many guys' legs, lives, like some of the best in the world, man. Mm. You know, so that's the, um, so yeah, anyways, they flew me back. I do have to say one part of coming back. So they, they ground medevac me to TQ. Uh, ground like took me in a and I believe in a truck to TQ then they put me in a bird like they stabilize you right make sure you're alive stabilize you and they put me in a bird in a CH-46 our, 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 Brunella, our banana helicopters and they took me to um, Bala, uh, Balad or something like that. anyways this other bigger air a base in Iraq where they can you know machines like start scans and stuff and they had me in this like space suit which is like aluminum foil, basically, that they put you in a cocoon because it's cold up there. And then like it's wrapped over you like this and then there's a big thing like over my face. Well, at this point, obviously, I'm probably morphine and everything else. But the bird shakes so much that the flap was shaking and pushing on my face. And it's the only part of the medevac that I remember um, outside of when they, they were taking me to the bird was being in, the, to this day, the most pain I've ever experienced in my life. And I remember through the crack in this thing as it's moving, seeing the crew chief, and he's like just standing over me. But think, I don't know how, I thought I was yelling at him, like, ow, you know, yeah. my face, but I don't know what I was saying, how much could come out, but just remember the thing, like, bruh, pushing on my face, which was just completely blasted. Ooh. <laughs> so that's the part of uh did you did you what was going do you recall going what was going through your mind man did you think you were gonna make it did you have thoughts of uh i don't remember any of that no no wow. i remember them putting me all the only the, the two parts of after that was was that was this, uh the second the first was they were putting me at some point they were putting me into one of the hospitals and all i remember seeing was sergeant scarborough um and I remember being so fucking emotional because I didn't know if my friends were alive still. It was, it was at the beginning, dude. I, I didn't know what happened to the Humvee. And Matt was in there. Herbie was in there. Yeah. And I remember like, I don't want to fucking go, you know? Could they all make it? Yeah. Oh. They all awesome. lived, dude. But at that moment, like, bro. Wow, man. I, I remember like, like laying there and looking up at Sergeant, Sergeant Scarborough. I remember he's just this tall, lengthy dude who also got, uh, got a bronze star from the deployment before. He's about one of the most badass human beings on this planet. And um, I remember like, I don't remember saying what I said or something. Like, feel, feel like I said, like, don't, I can't go or something, you know? Um, and that, the, the two parts I remember, the medevac, that's it, dude. But that, that was, remember this. I can't go or something. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But wow. yeah, yeah, it was the matter back. I'm glad you're here, man. Thanks, bro. I'm glad you're here to sit here and tell it, you know? So I was the, there was no Wounded Warrior Battalion. Mm. Yeah, this is 2006. Um, no battalion. We were at the Wounded Warrior Center. Mm. There was, uh, I think, 13 rooms. This one little building that was right outside uh, on Camp Pendleton by uh, Lake O'Neill, right by the Naval Hospital. It's just a little building. Well, they send you out there, and it, it's kind of interesting because the Marine Corps has been at war. We've done wars, but they were so unprepared for it. It was freaking nuts, right? So at this center where um, everything was donations. So we had like people had donated um, TVs, Tempur-Pedic beds, snacks, like the, everything was always full in there. And then there was people there to take us to our hospital appointments. Like that's all we did there, right? Marine Corps is essentially done. The... Like, you know, you don't, there's no, 
guard, if you stand duty, you're in your civvies. You know, I don't think, I don't remember ever putting camis back on, mm. right? Decision has already been made. You're getting out. You're getting kicked out. That's it. Um, so I threw into our center. Um, as I was getting out, it got stood up as a battalion, which it is now. So mm. that's the end of my term. So uh, like time. Um, so sometime between that. But anyways, we're in Wounded Warrior Center. Um, but it was messed up, dude. Like guys, everybody had a ridiculous amount of painkillers and access to really little oversight on anything. So guys were like snorting Percocets, like doing really dumb stuff, right? We've all been seriously injured. You know, my buddy Brian got shot in the face. He's there. He, um, like just a bunch of dudes that were like really messed up and like they gave us Xboxes, like they donated us Xboxes and TVs and put this whole bank of them in there for us to play. We played Call of Duty. Oof. Dude, we were th like breaking TVs every day. We were playing each other. We we're getting in fights. Not the best thing mm. with guys who just like, dude, I'm, I'm 19 years old now, right? Like I'm not old enough to drink. I think I was drinking. No, I don't think I was drinking heavily on medication and no, very little oversight. And I had no idea. Like I was still so injured in my head, dude. My brain, my brain was so racked. I ended up doing two and a half years of brain rehab, like speech pathology, occupational therapy. My brain was super rocked. Mm -hmm. And so we were all just messed up, dude, and doing some stupid, stupid stuff, like wow. punching through glass doors, pushing each other through walls, like DUIs. Like it was pretty crazy. We had one guy who had um, who has talked a lot of shit to everybody, but he was, uh, he was on boot leave in Oceanside, puking off the, off the pier and fell off and hit the sidewalk and hit his head. Oh. Like, so on boot leave, so he never even made it to uh, MCT and he was in there like talking shit to all these guys who just got back from war, which was oh. super. It was just an unhealthy, dude, it was unsupervised. They ended up putting cameras in there to watch us and stuff, because it got bad. It got wow. really bad. Um, How long were you in there? I don't remember like maybe months yeah something like that however because you're, you're just going to i was at scripps and sanitas in the brain rehab program so they just drove us down there to our appointments take us back up um we just sat there dude and then it was terrible dude they had we we're a dog and pony show they had all these celebrities who wanted to get their name with wounded vets because at the time that was a cool thing to do right so these celebrities came in there all the time and like oh thank you shake take picture take picture these generals come down picture picture and you're just like, okay, you know, like it, it was pretty bad, dude. Yeah. It was pretty bad. I just remember being like thinking, I don't know, dude, you come full stop. You go from like, I'm this infantry badass fucking guy to like, I'm injured and can't do shit, you know? And then yeah. here's 200 Percocets a day, you know, per month, you know, like it was gnarly. Wow. That time um, I ended up getting, um, actually getting uh, sent back to my unit for, um, uh, I don't know if this needs to go in there, but I was dating a girl Valentine's Day. Um, I was on duty, but duty wasn't in camis. Okay, like you, you had your room, which is the duty hat. Somebody needed something, knocked on the door. Um, staff sergeant tells me, "Hey, I know it's messed up. You're one of the only guys with a girlfriend, but you have duty. Okay, you can have your girl over. Make sure everybody's gone, all leadership." So um, I get a knock on the door. I open the door in my boxers. Major standing there. I thought everybody was gone. He wasn't. I thought it was like nine o'clock at night and I've been drinking wine. He's like, my office now. So put clothes on, not in camis, right? I don't think I had camis. So you go in there and he's like, well, you're on duty. You have a girl in your duty hut. They're still playing Marine Corps, but it wasn't Marine Corps. That's weird. Right? Like nothing had been Marine Corps, but they're still playing Marine Corps. So Gunny Greer comes down. I forget what the major's name is. And they're like, Gunny Greer hated me. He'd been shot in the leg, hated everybody, should not have been charged in, in charge of injured guys. Um, he comes down there screaming at me, you're going back to your unit, you're a piece of shit. They send me back to my unit. I'm already, they've already made the decision to boot me out, okay? They send me up for battalion level in JP. I'm already, what? dude, yeah. So my, my, I, have, I have a battalion level in JP on my record for having like having a girl who is my girlfriend there told I was okay to 
and sent back to my unit, my, my uh, first sergeant, who's the biggest piece of work. I hope everybody knows this. First Sergeant West is a piece of shit. Everybody know that. He stopped going on patrols with us in Iraq because somebody was going to kill him because he was a, the worst leader. He was an air winger. He got put in charge of weapons company 3-5. There's a whole other story. Wait, Sorry. dude, they NJP'd you after you've been blown the fuck up in war and in the process of getting yeah, out? Yeah, bro. Wow. Battalion man. level. We have a new battalion commander who's up there. Um, and they're like, yeah, battalion level, dude. Two pro projects didn't matter. Um, when it's all said and done, my uh, commander wall, who's a neurologist, came down there. The head of um, Scripps, the brain therapy, came to my battalion level to said, you guys have no idea what you're doing. This guy's so messed up. Like, in my head. I had no idea. I don't remember this stuff, right? Like, um, and said, so you guys got to just get this guy out of there. They ended up sending me back to the Wounded Warrior Battalion. After I got out, um, now Captain Mulder, my CO from, from Iraq called me. I was a civilian, called me out of the blue. I get this random number. He goes, Hey, um, Hey Sherburn, this is, this is Todd Mulder, Captain Mulder. Now he was up at the linguistic school. And he said, I just want to personally apologize to you. He said, at the time we thought you were a good Marine turned bad. He said that we thought after you got injured that you said, fuck it. And said like, I'm out of here. Like just acting out. And he's like, we didn't know what a brain injury was. Mm. And like, it meant a lot, but like, that was my last taste of the Marine Corps, dude. I'm so upset that I can't continue. But they're like, the last, fuck you, bro. What, what, what was the NJP? What'd they give you? Um, I think they gave me... Uh, they take your rank or anything? No, I don't think so. I, got, I, don't, I was on, I, was on a, I think I was on a Matorius Corporal Board. I didn't get that. Mm, I don't remember extra duty or something, or or just a, no. not even nothing. Probably no. just to put it, just to put it on your lack, record. Lack, loss of pay. Wow, man, that's all that. that's yeah, yeah. So that's there's, wild. There's 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 my <laughs> my JP dude. So so you get out. Yeah, sorry. Um, no, no, you're good. You're good. Uh, and what's it like for you, man? I, I, now I, I, you're you're at home. You're a civilian. Um, you have probably way too much time to think yeah still recovering i imagine i think you're always recovering with, with how significant uh you got injured yeah. right uh what was it like for you man mentally um i got out i would this sense of like two-week vap class i met a guy who was a navy corpsman um he became a roommate He's like hey let's move to huntington beach we moved to huntington beach and we decided to like put 100 percent of it behind us like Literally, it's a light switch. We're not supposed to talk about, like, it's done. Plain and simple, it's done. I still do my physical therapy. I'm in the brain rehab program in Long Beach now at the VA. Um, but we just decided we started partying. We went to college. Um, college was really hard with my brain. But, you know, we're like, this is what we're supposed to do. Everybody from that point was like, okay, you're done with the Marine Corps. Let's go. Let's move on. Dude, you're still only 19. Yeah, I'm, I'm now or maybe 20. 20? Yeah. I don't think I've turned 21 yet. Yeah. Wow. Um, and uh, I don't remember at how, what point, I, I, but it was pretty recent after that. Like as soon as I graduated the brain rehab program, I think I went to college. I went to o, uh, OCC, Orange Coast College. We were partying nonstop and just like, this is what's expected. I dealt with zero. Zero was dealt. I, didn't, I stopped going to therapists. I thought they sucked. Um, I, you know, t started kind of doing my own fitness. I started doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, and I literally suppressed everything bad and just moved on with my life. Went to college, um, out of college, uh, while I was still in college, um, got a job offer with Under Armour, dropped out of college for that. Um, well, I got my associate's degree and then working on my bachelor's, um, and uh, I forget how far I was in that, but I got a corporate offer with Under Armour. So I went to do that job. Um, had 90 employees working up in Rialto, working distribution. Um, had 90 employees under me. Like, I just, moving up, right? Wow. Just moving on to the next thing. I don't know, I'm in my 20s at this point. Had a girlfriend, super, super unhealthy. Um, got back into taking painkillers because I was in so much pain. 
became super addicted to painkillers. Um, girlfriend cheated on me, quit the job. They started uh, becoming a really big issue with job. Uh, it became an abusive situation with the job we were at and all the veterans ended up leaving. Um, and no girlfriend now, as unhealthy as it was, she was kind of my anchor. N haven't, haven't dealt with anything from before. I started spiraling. Living in Huntington Beach, drinking every single day, hitting my buddies up because I was scared to be by myself. So I was never, it was always downtown Huntington Beach, getting in fights all the time. Um, party, party, party. I got up to 215 pounds. I'm five foot four. Wow. I was big, big old beard. Everybody knew me as a party guy. Outward, I was this big, happy party boy. Everybody wanted to hit me up. Dude, what are we doing? We're going downtown? I was probably going out to the bars three or four days a week. I was getting, um, I don't know if I was still getting unemployed. I was getting a ton of money at that point, right? I had endless money. Except the, you have unemployment at some point. You have um, school tuition money coming in and my disability, 100%. Like you're just getting paid. So all it went to alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm addicted to pain pills at this point. And I started spiraling. And then it went from party, party, party to seclusion, seclusion, seclu seclusion. Um, doctors have always asked me, like, they always ask you the first thing, hey, are you suicidal? Absolutely not, no fucking way. Nope, nope, absolutely not. Like the first, the easiest no for me, always. I started spiraling so where I was in a tunnel and it kept getting darker and darker. You don't think a tunnel can get darker. Um, I had a boxer, uh, a, a dog, my dog uh, Rambo, my boxer, and he was always, I think he kept me alive way more times. But um, I finally got to a point where I took my 45 and I was gonna end it. Mm. And Rambo saved my life. Really? Yeah, dude, he came up and put his paw on me, you know? Really? And um, yeah, dude, it's, um, I've told this story a couple times now because I'm trying to tell it more because what's going on in the US right now with guys killing themselves, you know? And um, it's honestly one of the most beautiful things. When I didn't take my life is the moment I decided I was never gonna go there again. And it changed everything. I spiraled, I was at my lowest. And I'm not that guy, dude. I'm the most positive, ask anybody in my life. I've always, from day one as a kid through the Marine Corps, the most positive person. So for me to reach that point was real dark, you know? Mm -hmm. And in the moment that I put the gun down, I said, it's never happening again. You're changing all of it. I sold everything. I moved to Europe. Oh, really? 2016, dude. My cousin lives in Sweden. I'm done. Did you take Rambo with you? No, he was my buddy, had him. Oh. Um, he ended up having to get adopted. Um, mm. It wasn't fair to him, dude. He started getting secluded. He started getting separation anxiety. I would come back and he just like, it wasn't fair to him. Dude, you know? dogs are amazing, man. Bro, best friend, man. I yeah. still got him on my, show you a picture on my phone, dude. <laughs> He's just the best friend, man. The best wow. thing that ever happened to me and certainly saved my life. Wow. Um, but yeah, man, it, and, and you go from a dark, I heard Dakota Meyer talk about it and it was like, dude, he said the same thing. He's like, in the moment you choose light, you go from, this is it. I'm done. And if you have, it's nothing I did, dude. I'm just somehow blessed that I had this thought of like, no, you know? And then you choose life and you look back and say, I'm going to do something, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, man, I moved, lost all the weight, you know? Uh, lived in Sweden. I went to Israel, lived in Israel. Yeah, I was trying to join the Israeli military. I'm Jewish. <laughs> oh, shit. Really? With a beat up body, dude. I kept oh. my body, my mind said, you're going to do it. You're going to do it. And um, um, it, it never worked out. I herniated a disc over there. I just was pushing, you know. I think that I've always held guilt because I, I only got to do two and a half years in the Marine Corps. I don't think, I know for a fact, dude, that it, to this day, ask my girlfriend the number one thing that bothers me. Hmm. You know, it's not my fault, but oh. I only got to do two and a half years in the Marine Corps. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, but that you sucks. you did your time, man. You, I know. you you sacrificed your your life almost. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so now, 2019, I went to I was uh, 
Israel didn't work out, right? I kept forcing that, wasn't happening. Realized like, okay, stop this. <laughs> this is madness, right? Your body's not gonna take this. Um, went to India, met, kept making, I, I knew yoga was good, right? I've done it a couple of times, but there was still the stigma of like, men don't do that, you know? I met people like yoga, yoga, something in the back of my head said, hey, yoga would be good for you. You know, I've lost all the weight by this point, but I was still partying too much, you know? And uh, I meet a couple of people like, hey, I just got back from India. It's like, oh, I'm one of those people. I don't try a little bit. I have to like fully immerse myself. I go like, I'm partying too much. Okay, 180, I'm gonna go do this full time. So I go to India, went to Rishikesh, India, lived there for a month and a half, got my yoga teacher training, super gnarly, super like thin mat, um, vegan diet, you know, lost 25 pounds of muscle, like just become like, but it's immersed in it, you know, so. I uh, get certified yoga instructor, um, move back to Sweden. I'm not sure what I want to do, you know, things like that. I fly back to the U.S. 2000, in 2019 to come to the Marine Corps ball, to come to the 3-5 ball with my buddy, uh, with two of my buddies. The night I land, I land up in um, L.A. We go out uh, Halloween night of 2019 and meet my girlfriend at the bar. It's now three years, four years, you know. Oh, you met her there that, met that her at night? The bar. Oh, wow. And I still like decided to live outside the U.S. And so because of her, I'm back here now. Wow. So now I run a gym in San Clemente, I teach yoga. What's um, it called? Elevate Fitness. Nice. Yeah. Um, I'm teaching yoga for Injured Marine Semper Fi Fund. So this is start. I'm, I'm now trying to give back, you know. I've been blessed with the ability to look at things in a little bit different light, mm -hmm. you know, and now... Having seen that dark side, um, I just want to help guys without it. That's know, awesome, so, man. Um, where, where can people find your gym? Do you have a website? Yeah. Um, elevate underscore OC. Okay. Uh, is, uh, um, or elevate-fit.com is the gym. Okay. Um, yeah. the, the other yeah. one, you, the first one you said is your handle for Instagram? Uh, sorry, yeah. It's, uh, a handle for Instagram is elevate underscore OC. Mm -hmm. And then um, the uh, website is... Uh, Elevate, yeah, well, I don't know. Elevate, yeah, just, just, just search Elevate in San Clemente. Elevate San Clemente. Elevate Fitness in San Clemente. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Um, And then, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching via Zoom for uh, Intermarine Semper Fi Fund. The, those guys did like beyond, you know, when I came home, they gave me a grant to buy clothes and stuff because my wallet was still in Iraq. It was crazy. Wow. So um, you know, I'm doing some stuff. I teach some strength training for them. And I don't know where it's next. I don't know what's next, dude. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Well, that's awesome, man. Yeah. Sounds like you're doing great. Yeah. Uh, well, any last words before we cut the tape? Um, no, man. I mean, uh, just like uh, every day is still a struggle, you know, but with, I think, having this, having the ability now to think of things in a different light, like things still suck, right? Things are super hard. I'm still struggling with life, but knowing that there's an ability to stop and breathe or stop and do something else and like change that perspective. I think that's the, the amazing part that yoga has given me, mm. you know, so that's what I want to help some guys out with. Thanks for being here, Keen. Yeah, man. Appreciate it, brother. It's Thank a big you. deal for you to come sit here and share everything that you shared, man. It takes a lot of uh, courage um, and uh, I really appreciate you sharing with us. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. Push it to the limit. I can't go no more. Red light. No way. I'm coming back home. Long dirt road all